Hey everyone, how are y'all doing? So last year I took a look at the Jack and Daphne trilogy and ended up having different opinions than I thought it would. I love Jack 1 as much as I did when I played it the first time, and I played it 5 more times to 100% completion too. I even streamed it back in August of last year. While well, I hated Jack 2 when I played it for the first time, and I still don't enjoy the final third of the game, I eventually came around to it and started loving the game to the point of me actually loving it more than the first game. Do I think it's as repeatable as the first game? No, but, I, but do I think it's still a fun game overall? Definitely. Well, unfortunately though, the opposite happened to, happened to Jack 3 for me. I used to love Jack 3, but now I still think it's a good game, but I don't like it as much as Jack 1 or 2. In my opinion, kind of focused too much on fitting other genres into this game instead of the regular platform the series is known for. But hey, the changes happen for so frequently that I never really get bored from it. Now at the end of my Jack 3 review, I said I was going to review the rest of the series at some point, and since it's getting close to the 20th anniversary of the first game as I'm writing the script, I think it's the perfect time to get back into Jack and Daxter series, but we only have 3 games left to review, so let's continue with Jack X. Now, when I first started the Jack and Daxter Marathon, I was originally going to review Jack X that year, but since, I did, but since I couldn't find any copies of that game by the time, and I only had the original trilogy, I just said I would just review Jack X and along with the rest of the games of the series another time, maybe around the 20th anniversary. And thankfully for my good beans, there's actually an event called Jack Month going around Twitter where people make Jack related content and all types of fan art. As I'm writing a script, the event is almost over in, in about a week. If you haven't seen anything about it yet, I highly recommend that you check it out. There's a lot of great content creators like Power Soul Zeke and all the talented artists making the race stuff. Anyway, the only kind of exposure I had had to Jack X were from reviews like Ant Dude, Rami Raccoon, and recently Square Eye Jack, and all of them had pretty opposing opinions. For Andu, he doesn't really like the game that much. He thinks the game has a good story, but the gameplay is just too hard for him to the point of him actually rage quitting. And for the others, they actually love the game, and that kind of worries me about how I might feel about the game, since it was such an eye for it, it's been kind of mixed, meaning that I would either love the game or hate it. But I finally got the game in mid-November, and, and I had a pretty positive first impressions, but let's not get into too much detail about that just yet. We still have a story to talk about, and like always, there's going to be a spoiler alert. If so, if you're just here for my experiences, then just skip to this part of the video. I'll give you 5 seconds. Taking place after the, after Errol's defeat in Jack 3, Jack and the gang are invited to the reading of Cruz's last will from his daughter, and somehow this thing managed to give birth to that. I would start asking questions about how that's even possible, but honestly that would just kind of get disgusting. So anyway, the gang takes a sip of the wine that, and then they read Cruz's will, only to find out that that guy Cruz poisoned the wine, which everyone, including Rang, drank. So now they need to enter the competition called Combat Racing to get the antidote for the poison that they drank. They're constantly told by the showrunner JT Bliss that they're constantly being filmed on national TV and that everyone's watching. So from here on out, the story just kind of pauses. Any cutscene from now and up to the final cup aren't really story related. The only thing that really matters is that throughout the game, Jack and his crew are continually harassed by someone named Mizo who made a bet with Crew and who was doing anything in his power to stop Jack from winning races. After winning the championship, Jack and friends finally win the antidote, but JT becomes, get, comes in angry and, and proceeds to take away the antidote from Rain, and it's revealed that he's Mizo. Mizo drives away with the antidote, with Jack going after him. After a quick drive-by, Mizo crashes into an fiery explosion. You have a habit of leaving people to die, don't you? You get used to it. The game starts celebrating into, that they're finally cured, celebrating into, that they're finally cured, and Rank gives them a farewell while leaving a figment of Cruz's video diary, which Dax activates by accident, presenting a hologram of Cruz telling Rain how to pour the wine and to avoid being poisoned and outlining his plan for his family to become the top crime family in the region. Revealing that she was just like her father the whole time, and then calls up her associates to her a meeting in a story that will never see the light of day because of how Naughty Dog practically left Jack and Daxter to die. But at least Jack and Kira finally kiss without Daxter interrupting this time. So I know I felt like I was skimming over a lot of story during this summary, but that mostly has to do with the fact that this game's story doesn't really have, have a lot going on between the first act and the third act. While I do think the setup is pretty interesting, the story as a whole leaves a lot to be desired. So first, let's talk about how Mizo's built up throughout the game. Now, they did something similar like this in Jack 2 with revealing Core as a metalhead leader. How did it in that game that it gave out subtle hints about, about him might not being up to no good? 
The hints in this game feel more obvious before, with JT Bliss giving not so subtle facial expressions to Jack whenever he dismisses anything about Mizo. By the halfway point, I could tell that JT Bliss is already Mizo, because the gestures that he makes when he brings up Mizo's name weren't hidden that well at all. And then there's the fact how Razor, who's Jack's rival throughout the races, keep harassing the crew about how they're hiring new challengers, but outside of the robot that comes later in Cleaver, it's basically the same people you race over and over again. Some of the racers are even on your own team. This isn't something to really fault the story on, but it just shows that the need is some more enemy racers. But there is some things that I think that this game's story does better than the original trilogy. For example, they finally fixed their mistake and gave Kira more of an arc this time. In Jack 3, she was kind of sidelined for Ashlyn to be the main love interest, and in doing so, she was reduced to being a background character with two to three lines. Now she's back to being herself. There's also a conflict between Kira and Samo, so where Kira wants to participate in the racers, but Samo does, doesn't want her to because he doesn't want to see her get hurt. But Daddy, I can do it! I can race better than any of those guys! You know I can! Yes! I, I mean, no! You can't! Well, I mean, yes you can, but that's not the point. I won't have it! A woman's place is in the garage fixing cars! Did I just hear someone use a microaggression? <laughs> But during the last race, Kira races anyway, and after seeing her do so, Samus Kareja congratulates her on racing. That was good arc. Other than that, this game's cutscenes can be pretty funny at times, and can actually get a laugh out of me. That's just basically himself for the majority of the game. The interactions with Jack and the rest of the game are pretty nice to listen to, since the voice actors are pretty great for their line delivery, then honest, honestly, my favorite parts of this game are whenever when JT Bliss and Pecker are always competing for the spotlight with each other. There's even one scene where Pecker just straight up flips off to JT. Oh yeah, you just got schooled. Birds do not school, they flock, so flock off! <laughs> Don't let your kids watch it! So while the story's pretty weak, the gameplay more than makes up for it. So let's just get down to the basics. This game is basically just a more violent version of CTR. This game is pretty much like that, but instead of racing, there's more of a focus on combat, hence the name, Combat Racing. Racing is still a main priority, but the name of the game is Destroy Other Racers in a Fire Explosion. This game's fast, frantic, and probably one of the hardest racers I've ever played. So since Naughty Dog already had a, had made the Crash Team Racing before, making this game and had vehicles established in the earlier games, specifically in Jack 3, they basically had to make a game based on that entire concept, and I'm gonna be honest, I was a little bit scared of how the emergency might feel in this game. If you see my Jack 3 review, then you know that I can't stand the driving in that game. All the buggies controlled like ass, and it's one part of the game that hasn't really aged out that well in my opinion. Which kind of makes it worse since they're, since they're a huge part of the game. Here, I'm happy to say that I came out pleasantly surprised. The cars in this game control so much better than they do in Jack 3. They're not as slippery as they used to be, and whenever I crash into something, it feels like a mistake I made and not something that was completely out of my control. Not to say that you'll always have that feeling, but more on that later. The game's driving mechanics are pretty simple. On the bottom left and right corners, you see two meters. On the left is your health meter, which determines how many hits your car can take before combusting into flames. You can also hold on to your defensive items to block anything that's homing in onto you or blow up anyone from behind. On the right is your speed gauge. It shows you how much boost you can use before it drains. Doing power slides are a great way to keep getting more turbo boost to keep the speed going, but don't use up all your speed too early or else you won't have enough to boost to the, through the final lap. And if you boost at any chance you get, you collide to every single wall you see. This is also where you hold your offensive items to destroy other racers in front of you. If you get a high number of kills, you go into a dark ego state where your, where your items are stronger and you don't kick as much damage from the other racers. I know it sounds complicated in explanation, but when you play the game for yourself, all this will click. And what will help that the game has a pretty good tutorial which that shows you all the mechanics that the game has to offer. It's one of those games where it's easy to learn but hard to master. And yeah, it took me at least maybe 4 or 5 races to finally get power sliding down, but once I did, it felt so good at making sharp turns in this game. Honestly, I honestly think that is better than CTR in that aspect, because there's something about pulling off the perfect turn in this game compared to CTR. It might have something to do with the fact that the vehicle physics in this game are a little bit more heavier than it were in CTR. Although while some cars feel pretty good to control, others just can control like complete garbage. I'm not sure if it's just if this was just me, but while cars that control perfectly fine in one track are slightly more slippery than, than those stairs that Peter fell off of, they're, they're completely uncontrollable. A part of me feels that Night Dog did this on purpose to emphasize on experimentation on other cars and make you try not to use the same car for every race, which is fine. Like, I'm all for experimentation, but this wasn't the way to do it. My vehicle from going from having good handling to feeling like it's on ice not only does it make sense, but it's also pretty damn annoying. But let's talk about the track design in this game. So unlike a game like Mario Kart, the vehicles are a bit more heavier and not as quick to turn, but the track design definitely accommodates for that since there's no sharp turns and they're mostly just straightforward and linear. 
They also have shortcuts you can take every once in a while, but they involve more looking around like in CTR. I haven't found too many shortcuts in this game yet, but if it's like anything like CTR, I'm sure I'm gonna know these tracks like the back of my hand in two years time. They also encourage you to power slide a lot for speed, but the city and sewer mass suck though. The city because you're full of these tight turns, which like I said before, doesn't go along with Jack X's driving physics. The sewer mostly has the same problems as the city, except for the fact that there's also some parts of the map that where you have to make these jumps, which you can't influence in midair, so, so the moment your ass is in the air, you're either juking left or right or colliding face first into a wall. But that's only it. The tracks are honestly well designed, and while the game can get on a little bit unfair sometimes, it still feels like you're in control of everything. So I'm sure you've all noticed these capsules that are placed around the track every once in a while. Like any other car racer, you get items to screw the other players over. These are basically just eco power-ups from Jack 1, but if it was a racing game. The blue ego increases your speed, the red ego gives you a defensive item, the yellow ego gives you offense items, and the green ego will help you, help you regain your health. There's a little bit of a risk reward system with these items. You can either use all, all your missiles at once, or you can use one now, save the other two later. The same thing can be done for the defensive items, you can use them to blow up anyone behind you now, or you can use them to block any incoming items, recommend the latter because the AI in this game don't doesn't fuck around. It isn't that bad in the early parts of the game, during the later half, it's, it's honestly crazy how many times these guys can decimate me in one race. But you have the power to do that too, so the game definitely feels more balanced with that in mind. There, yeah, there's still that one blue shell item that can fuck up any foe you had, and, and sometimes you can blow, get blown up in the moment you were, you were about to finish a line, and that can sometimes make you rage quit, but even then, you can still block it with a shield item. The element of randomness is still there, but you can fight back. I don't get that feeling in Mario Kart, and, and not even CTR. I think I've gone enough without mentioning how this game's story mode works. So you have about four that have four or five specific, specific challenges. You earn the medals for completing these challenges with a certain score or beating them in first, second, or third place. Once you earn enough medals, you enter a Grand Prix qualifier where you have to earn a gold medal in order to be able to qualify for the final race. After that's done, you enter the next cup and you repeat. That might sound repetitive on paper, but there's a lot of stuff to do so you don't feel like you're doing the same thing over and over again. It also helps that this game is pretty short. It can take about 6 to 7, maybe 10 hours if you completely suck at the game. So that helps from keeping the game from feeling repetitive. All the modes in this game are traditional races. The time trials, creature hunting, capture the flag, road rash, death races, atom races, and turbo boosting. Since I already covered the main races, let's talk about the other modes. Time trials are basically like the ones from crashing racing. You collect these time tokens that freeze the time for faster result. I was trying to get first place in these challenges isn't as much as a flick in the nuts and trying to, as trying to get a platinum roll from CTR. Creature hunting is pretty much exactly what it sounds. You find creatures, you shoot them, and gain points for doing so. If you get 10 points or at least more than your opponents, you get first place. And if your item picked up, you try to get all these precursor artifacts. Again, if you get 10 or have more than anyone, everyone else before the time runs out, you win. In Roller Rash, you drive into as many cars as possible for points. It sounds fun in concept, and it really isn't too bad later on in the game, but your car can sometimes spin out of control if you run into, into a lot of vehicles in one path. Then there's death races. These are personally my least favorite challenges of the game. Here you shoot as many cars as you can. It's really just road rash with, but with weapons. It's not a bad mode, but it gets repetitive after a while. Every time I gotta play these missions, I'm like, oh god, now I gotta play this again. Next is Capture the Flag. It's a pretty basic mode, but instead of the flag, it's a power soul, and you bring it to your base. Finally, there's the Turbo Boosting mini game, which is personally my favorite. You grab a power soul, and you boost until you get to 100%. Then you get a defensive item to block anything behind you while that power soul is being utilized as your offensive item. It's not a very complex mode, but it's pretty fun to play through in my opinion. As for completing these challenges, you earn precursor orbs. You can use these to upgrade your stats to your vehicle and also concept art. You can also customize your vehicle to anything you want by changing the colors or changing its appearance as a whole, from its doors to with wheels. Overall, this game's customization is pretty solid. So outside the main story mode, there's also exhibition mode where you get to play as play with any cars you want and have free control on what characters you play as. It's a pretty basic mode for a kart racer like this. You can still play all the extra modes from adventure mode to here. You and a friend, or in my case a brother, can play with each other in the versus races. This is also the first Jack game that has multiplayer options. You can change the setting like limited eco power-ups or changing the score limits. So since I got most of the gameplay out of the way, let's talk about the cool shit this game has. If you have a save file of Jack 1, 2, and 3, you can play as the version of Jack from those games. And if you have a save file of Ratchet and Clank, you can play as Ratchet and but not Clank. But maybe that's just asking too much. It's a good thing that I did that Ratchet and Clank marathon when I did though. 
You can connect your PSP and get all the characters from Daxter in this game, which I don't have. Yeah, but if you have a 100% complete save file for Daxter, you can unlock the Daxter Mobile, which is the best part of the game. You can also race as Daxter and Pecker if you play the game for 5 hours. And just like the Jack games from the past, you can unlock a hero mode, but this time you have to unlock it from complete the main game from for to full completion. So if you're a completionist, then that's more hours you'll get out of this game. I sort of spent the most time explaining the gameplay for this game more than any other game in the series. But anyway, let's talk about the graphics. Just like the games that preceded it, the game was really pretty. Although some tracks can look pretty dark at times, that's mostly has to do with the fact that I was playing the PS2 version of this game on an HD TV. But other than that, that everything looks pretty good. The character models are on par with the original trilogy. The UI is pretty smooth and clean, and the background ones are pretty busy. Even love the little details like whenever your power jack is power sliding or boosting, Dex is holding on for dear life. I really love stuff like that. But the cutscenes are pre-rendered, so it doesn't really look as good as Jack 2 and 3's cutscenes. I'm just gonna go off real quick. What did they do to Torn's outfit? He had one of the coolest fits in, in the last two games, and now they just gave him this generic looking white shirt, as an Australian YouTuber once said. <laughs> and I just need to point this out real quick, and I know I'm gonna sound like a pervert for this playing Super Butter Buns, not me, she pointed it out, and now I can't get it out of my head. But how come Ashland's did he start pouncing all over the place from the tiniest movements, yet rains don't move a single inch? This game's jiggle physics are really inconsistent. Other than that, I've, I have nothing else to say. This game's graphics are pretty impressive for a late PS2 hardware. And this game's soundtrack is actually one of the most memorable things about the game. Fast Jack games uh, OSTs were alright at best, but they, mo they mostly were ambient without any kind of beat to speak of. In my Jack 3 review, I did say that the game had a more memorable ambient soundtrack, but this is the first time a Jack game has some kind of music to write home about. The composers of this game did, did an amazing job on this game's soundtrack, and the song of this game is something, something that I can never really get tired of. Although I feel like the soundtrack might be a preference thing, so people who aren't into rock music might definitely hate this soundtrack. I mean, I love it, but I have a bias to, to the electric guitar, so of course I would say that. The voice actors actually do a pretty good job too. Even love how during races, your opponents will taunt you whenever they blow you up. Oh yeah! And, and they'll even give you tips during the navigation screens. This is the Red Cup Grand Prix. In this challenge, you'll have to compete in three events in a row and finish with the highest total score to win it all. Don't panic if you fall behind in the earlier rounds. It's the final score that counts. Look out for UR86 on the track. He'll be your toughest competition today. And also, when I was doing research for this game, I actually found out that Terra Strong actually voices Kira in, in this game in Jack 3. Yeah, right even from Teen Titans. Okay, why did the aardvark cross the road? To beat up the idiot telling jokes about him. The cast does a great job here, and overall audio presentation is great stuff. So I'll be honest, I was kind of scared that this game would be just like Jack 3's cars for the entire game, but, and admittedly one or two cars felt that way. But honestly, I didn't think I would have as much fun with this game as I thought I would. I honestly think I might like this just as much as Jack 1 and 2. The gameplay mechanics are, are pretty well developed, the track design is top tier stuff, and the soundtrack is actually really memorable this time. The gameplay that was established in CTR feels so much better here, but with the heavier car physics and the risk reward system with items and boosting. So all that being said, I actually recommend you getting this game to only see how well Naughty Dog would do for their second kart racer. Although the game can be very hard, so as long as you have some kind of patience, then go for it. You can get it on the PlayStation Store for PS5 along with the rest of the trilogy, which by the time I ran this video, was going on sale for $20. But it's not really a remaster of the game, it's just an upscale port than anything, which for some reason doesn't have online support, which is weird because the original PS2 release from 2005 has online support. But yeah, Jack Dexter is a fun game. I think I might like it even better than Crash Team Racing. At this point in the series' life, Jack and Dexter as a franchise sold 12 million copies and would be seen as one of the main mascots for the PlayStation 2, next to Ratchet and Clank. But like I said before, this was the last J&D developed by Naughty Dog, and since they felt like moving on to other franchises like Uncharted and The Last of Us, Jack 4 was in development and knew the storyline from the original series, but it was scrapped in favor for The Last of Us since it was too realistic for this series. So while Naughty Dog needed to, decided to take a break from Jack and Daxter for the time being, they decided to let other developers take over for a spin-off game. So next time we meet, we're going to be looking at the first game that was developed without Naughty Dog's involvement, Daxter for the PSP. I don't know how long this will take me to get this video out, but I promise I won't have you waiting too long. And also, I really want to thank you guys for being really patient for while I wasn't really uploading any videos. And I also want to apologize for not uploading for so long. I'm trying to get a new computer for that span of time, so that now you know why. So anyway, with all that being said, thank you guys for watching, and I'll see y'all next time. Peace.
everyone is just post editing ish so i forgot to write a, a part of the video where i think my friend super saw might be mikey for making a third intro so he has special things to him he's cool so um yeah go go subscribe to him so i'm gonna leave now